The theme has been a vision for living. That's the series. Uh, first of all, we talked about the principle of vision. Uh, the Bible says in Proverbs 29, verse 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. We first tried to establish what a vision means. What does it mean when we're talking about a vision, a vision for living? Really, it comes down to this. God has a vision for every one of our lives that are here today. Every one of us. God has a vision for your life. In other words, He has a purpose. He has a plan. You're not an accident. You weren't put on this earth uh, by accident. You're here for a divine reason. God has a purpose and a plan for your life. And I'll hasten to say that that for, for everyone, that means, number one, that you know Him as your Savior that you know Him personally as your Savior. Not that you get religious, not that you try to do your best to climb the ladder to get to God, but that you accept the wonderful gift of salvation that Jesus purchased on the cross of Calvary when He died on the cross and when He rose again the third day. He wants to have a relationship with you. And so that's why God calls every one of us to live on purpose. So as we live, we keep the end in view. So God invites us to seek Him and to discover what His perfect plan is for our lives. Then with that plan in mind, we can reach His and our greatest dreams, what He has for our lives. And I want to say this, anything less than living life and finding life in Jesus Christ and living the abundant life in Jesus Christ is an absolute ripoff. Anything less than that is a mistake, it's a lie, it's a ripoff. Because that's what Jesus, what He purchased, not only is life and eternal life, but I'm telling you, He purchased something even greater. We're more than conquerors through Him, and He wants us to live that way. So many people are being robbed. Some, the, the Bible says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. And I'm telling you, you can find what you've really been missing in Jesus Christ. You can find in Him. And so, we, we, we talked about that already, uh, a vision for living. That's the principle of a vision, basically. The second thing is the problem of a vision. We talked about how a vision is the eternal interrupting time. It's a holy God calling fallen man to Himself. It's a loving God reaching out to souls on their way to destruction. It's a wise God reaching out at the right time. It's an almighty Lord foiling the plans of the enemy. The problem of a vision. Why does God give a vision to people? It's not just about us. We live in a very self-centered world, don't we? To where it's all about me, what can I get, what's in it for me. Uh... But God teaches us that we can live a greater life than that that's about others. That's about Him, number one. That's about others, number two. Because that's another one of the big lies that if you put yourself first, your needs first, your happiness first, if you do all that, you'll finally find true peace and happiness. But folks, I'm telling you, that's not true. The truth of the matter is, is when you find out how to invest in the lives of others, care about others, you start trying to finding true purpose and, um, and vision. And so we talk about the principle of vision, the problem of vision. Tonight, I want to talk to you for a little bit about the pain of a vision. The pain of a vision. How many of you like pain? Uh, hopefully not too many of you. That'd be weird. Uh, some people do. The pain of a vision. Now, uh, I want to start. That, that's, the, that's the overall thought. But I want to start kind of backing up with that a little bit. I want to start in Genesis 37. And remember, I'm really preaching about a vision. And I'm using the life of Joseph tonight to, to apply these principles. We could go many places to apply these principles. But we're going to mainly focus on Genesis here and Joseph. And I'm saying all that because this isn't like a verse-by-verse -verse exposition like I would normally do of the life of Joseph, but it's just using this as an example. Notice, first of all, before we ever get to the pain of a vision, I want to talk about the thrill of a vision. The thrill of a vision. Notice Genesis 
37, 37, verse number 5, where the Bible says, And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Hear, I pray you, this dream that which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose, and, and, and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made a, a, a obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream, and told it his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. Now I'm going to stop right there just in general to talk about the thrill of a vision. And here's what I mean by the thrill of a vision. It's pretty exciting for me to think about God Almighty reaching into time, coming to where you are, number one, allowing you an opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and know Him as Savior, which is awesome, right, in and of itself. What's greater than being saved? What's greater than having the forgiveness of sins and, and, and really understanding, uh, man, that when you have Jesus Christ, you have it all. That's wonderful. There's a thrill to that. But then you find out He's got an abundant life for you. You find out He's got a calling for your life. And you're just like, oh my goodness. In Joseph's situation, God, these dreams that Joseph is having, God gave him these dreams. This is the vision that God has for his life. And that's exciting, right? I mean, th to think about the Creator, the, the God, the Eternal One, the All-Wise One, reaching out and saying, I've got something for you. I'm going to use your life. I've got something for you to do. That's an absolute thrill. You know, as we read last week, I believe, in Ezekiel, where the Lord said, we, we sought for a man who would stand in the gap and make up the hedge. But they said we found nobody. God was looking for somebody to, fi to fill in the gap. Isaiah said this. He said, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said, said I... Here am I, Lord, send me. Now I wonder, have any of you ever said that? Here am I, Lord, look my way, send me. Lord, I give my life to you. I want you to use my life. Lord, you've given your life for me. It's my reasonable service to say, yes, Lord, here's my life. Lord, use me. I hope you have. If you haven't, I challenge you to do that. I'm going to, you'll hear this quote again on Sunday, but it was, I think it was David Livingston, the great missionary and explorer to Africa, who said, uh, God always, uh, oh my goodness, God always gives the best to those who leave the choice to Him. God always gives the best to those who leave the choice to Him. Uh, and the decision to Him. And I, I, I'm just telling you that there was a day in my life to where I said, okay, Lord, I want you to use me. God, I'm so glad you saved me. I'm so glad that you love me. Here's my life. Here's my life. And when I was 19 years old, the Lord finally settled it in my heart to where here's what it is that I want you to do. I want you to preach the gospel. I want you to be a preacher. You all oh, the thrill. The thrill a few years later when God settled it in my heart. I mean, I was thrilled. I want you to go to South Dakota. God just settled this in my heart. And I'm telling you, weeks like this, it's just I'm so thankful, right? Um, and I say that tongue in cheek because I'm, I, really, I truly am. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I'm so glad I'm here. Times like this, you wonder, why do people live here? What is this? Well, I mean... At some point, did somebody not just think, you know, we're going, to move. we're going back to where we came from. This is ridiculous. Uh, but, but I say that in, in all sincerity, I can tell you that, that even in the midst of all of this, I am still thrilled that this is where God called me and this is what God called me to do. There's a thrill. It had to be a thrill for Joseph. He was excited to tell his brothers, man, let me tell you about this dream I had. 
This is awesome. Now, his brothers didn't think it was awesome, uh, as you read in the text. But it's a thrill. It, it, it was a thrill for the Apostle Paul when Jesus appeared to him and called him to be the Apostle to the Gentiles. It's a thrill. It's a thrill when these prophets are called and when these different people are called, when, when Esther is called to, to stand up and make a difference for God in the Persian kingdom. It is an absolute thrill. So there's the thrill of the vision. But to get to the point, one of the main points of the message tonight is this, the trial of the vision. Because the pain of the vision, the thrill of a vision, the trial of a vision. Notice what we've already read. You saw in the verses I was reading, in the midst of the dream, his brothers were hating him. Uh, but in verse, and by the way, don't think everybody's going to be excited that you decided to live for Jesus and give your life to God. Don't expect people to throw you a party or give you a cookie. Somebody might. But there might be some people that kind of hate on you a little bit. Uh, all right. But, uh, but, but notice down in verse number 19, the trial of a vision. Verse 19. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him. My goodness. And cast him into some pit, and we will say some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. I mean, my goodness. His brothers want to kill him literally are conspiring to kill this boy. Now look over into verse 23. And it came to pass when Joseph was coming to his brethren that they stripped him out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him, and they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it, so it's a well. And they sat down to eat their bread and so forth. Um, notice that verse 28. So... The, the older brother Reuben come along and they said, hey, great news. We caught Joseph and we're going to kill him. The older brother says, you know, super nice guy. So he says, don't kill him. Let's, you know, let's come up with another plan. And before they come up with another plan involving Reuben, all of a sudden some Midianites came by, some slave traders. And it's like, we know we'll just sell our brother, our 17 year old brother to be a slave. I'm telling you now, Joseph's thrill of, guys, let me tell you about this dream that God has for my life. It's wonderful. It's amazing. Look what God's doing. It has now come to a trial. His brothers hate him. They've stripped him of his coat. They've beat him up. They've thrown him into a pit. They've, they've uh, sold him to be a slave. Verse 20. I'm sorry, verse 28. Well, that's where you read about them selling him to be a slave. And when he first got to Egypt... When you go over to chapter 39, you'll find out that when he first got to Egypt, things actually were starting to look up. He actually became the head of a, of a prominent house. He was a slave, but he was a prominent slave in a very prominent home until he was falsely accused and thrown into prison for the next 10 years. Where's the thrill of the vision now? There's the, there's the thrill of the vision, but now there's the trial of the vision. You know, the thing that I'll say here, why does, God, why does God allow this stuff to happen? You ever ask that? I'm sure you probably do. Whether you ask it in Joseph's life or whether you ask it in your own life. Why does God allow this to happen? You know, why do good things happen to bad people? And bad things happen to good people? You know, we, we, we ask these questions. But the fact of the matter is, man, we live in a sin-cursed world. We live in a world where bad things happen. We live in a world of death and disease and bad decisions that people make that affect others. But the, the point just simply is this. In all of this, because, you know, we'll, we'll see in just a moment. Think about, think about with me for a moment. Think about Abraham. Some of us are reading through the Bible uh, in a year, uh, chronologically in a year. Uh, so, so we're just now reading about Abraham, but God comes to Abraham. What a thrill. God appears to Abraham, calls him out of Ur the Chaldees. And he says, okay, Abraham, man, I'm going to do something in your life. I've got an exciting vision for your life. I've got an exciting plan for your life. Let's go. This is exciting. Okay, great. Come on, man. We're going to, what are you, man, I, I'm going to give you a son. And your son is going to end up giving, uh, you know, producing a nation that's going to bless the entire world. 
Oh, wow, well, that sounds great. I mean, to have a son and he's going to do it. Yeah, that, so, so let's go, let's go. But if you read something, it was decades. Decades went by. Matter of fact, I think there was about a 20-year period, at least 10-year period, where, God, where Abraham didn't hear from God at all. At all. And then uh, during that time, then finally when Abraham is uh, 100 and his wife is 90, then God says, okay, Abraham, it's time. It's time. Sarah is going to have a baby boy. That's what God does. Can you imagine that baby boy is born, the excitement, the thrill of that? Up until about 30, about 30 years later when God says, okay, now I want you to take your son and go offering. Right? The, the, the trial of a vision. Now, God never wants human sacrifice. He's never demanded that. But it was a trial of, uh, of, um, of Abraham's faith. There's a trial. Because ultimately, here's the thing. God wants to do a work. See, He's saved. If you're saved by God's grace, He saved you for a purpose. He's got something. He places you in the church to, for, for His calling, for His purpose, for what He wants to do through your life. He wants to do something through your life. But before God can do something through our life, He must first do something in our lives. So God wants to do something through us but if he's the, the greater work he does in us, the greater work he'll be able to do through us. That's where the trial comes in at. Because I'll tell you, through trials, you learn to trust God. Through trials, you learn that you learn that you need him and that you don't have really what it takes. You need him. We talked about it before, but a vision is rarely convenient. A vision isn't often comprehensive. You know, we mentioned before, in other words, God doesn't say, okay, I'm going to call you and I'm going to tell you A, you know, A to Z right as soon as I call you. Exactly how everything's going to go. You know, a, a vision, though, may not be convenient. It may not be comprehensive, but you mark this down. A vision is always coordinated by God Almighty. In other words, He has a plan, a perfect plan. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows exactly what's going to happen. The Apostle Paul prayed this. He said, that I may know Him, Philippians 3.10, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. And notice this, and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death. The power of His resurrection sounds great. Knowing Him sounds great. I want to know Him. Ooh, the power of the resurrection. Yeah, give me some of that power. Okay. But here's what comes along with it as well. The fellowship of His sufferings. Being made conformable unto His death. So before we can experience the power of the resurrection in our lives the way He wants it to be, we've got to come to a place where we die to ourselves. We die to our dreams. We, we die to our, some of our perceptions. It's interesting as we think about a vision. I heard this a few years ago and it just really, really stuck with me. I believe we first read about it with the prophet Isaiah. But after that, when you begin to look at the prophets, you'll see this. Isaiah, it was told to Isaiah many times as he would deliver a message to different countries and nations and things of that nature. But here it is. The vision would be called the burden. The burden of the Lord. The burden for this people. The burden for this nation. A vision is a blessing, but I'm telling you, it is also a burden. It's, it's also a burden. Think about the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus came to this earth to be the Savior of all men. Jesus said, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus came loving. Jesus came saving. But here's the thing. I'll tell you, you want to know where Jesus' vision ultimately led Him? It led Him to Gethsemane, where He prayed and, and, and sweat drops, uh, great drops of sweat, great drops of blood. He was broken there in Gethsemane. And then, then all the way to dark Golgotha, his vision led him to a place of a trial, a place of difficulty. There's a thrill of the vision, 
But there's also the trial of the vision. I mentioned the apostles earlier. How exciting do you think Paul was to go out and do a work for the Lord? You go read the way he went, went about it. He was pretty excited about it because he just committed his life to it. With just reckless abandon, he went after the vision that God had for his life. But it wasn't long till he was beaten. It wasn't long till he was shipwrecked. It wasn't long till he was imprisoned multiple times. You know, I, I, I have the opportunity from time to got time to go be a guest preacher at, at, at churches in, in different uh, locations. And of course, one of my first questions is, hey, where, uh, uh, where would I be staying? You know, what are, what are my arrangements while I'm there? That's one of the first things I want to kind of, you know, one of, the, one of the first things you want to know about. Well, you know what, Paul didn't ever have to worry about that. Okay, he, he just pretty much booked the local jail, right? <laughs> He just went to town and preached, and before it was over with, they threw him into the jail. He had an exciting vision, but he also had a trial. Um, and you talk about a burden. Go read Romans 9 about the burden that Paul had for his people. The burden, the brokenness that he had for his people. That was a vision. There's a trial. There's a burden to a vision. But here's the good news. Um, there is also the togetherness of a vision. In other words, God never gives an individual a vision solely for that individual. The Apostle Paul said it this way, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to them that are at Rome also. I am ready to preach. God has a vision for this church right here. You people, me. He has a vision for each of us. And to, so to become a part of this church is to embrace this vision, the vision that God has for His life or for your life. 1 Corinthians 12, 18 says, But now God hath set the members, every one of them, in the body as it pleased Him. Now, I'm really talking to you here for a second, the folks in this church. In this church, you have an opportunity to play a leading role in God's vision for this church. Um, a, a vision for our families, a vision for our community. You have an opportunity to play a, a key and a leading role in that. And I'm telling you, that's a thrill. And truly, we do that. By design, we give people opportunities to serve, to lead, to, to, uh, you know, to, to come side by side and say, yeah, yeah, launch out. You've got a burden for this? Man, yeah, let's go for it. We're going to help you. I'll get behind you. I'll, you know. But I want to let you know something. That's a thrill, man. Oh, man, this is exciting. Wow, we're reaching people. And, and man, we had this many people show up to our Bible study. And, oh, this is just wonderful. It's great. It's a thrill. But I, I wished I have, have done, had done better letting people, helping people to understand something. There's a trial, too. There's an opportunity to get out here and serve. There's an opportunity to get out here and lead in the vision that God has. But along with that opportunity, there's going to come some tr trouble, some burdens, some trials, some challenges. You just mark it down. Sometimes those challenges will be, you know, in the way of circumstances. Sometimes those trials can be in the way of people. You know, people that don't understand or just miscommunication along the way. There's a lot of things that can be challenging as you're out front leading. But the body works together, doesn't it? The Bible says, for we are laborers together with God. It also says to bear one another's burdens. Bear one another's burdens. You listen to me closely here. There's a thrill to the vision. We're working together. There's a trial to a vision. But I'm telling you, there's a togetherness to a vision. And that's this. You don't have to go through it by yourself. Whatever you're going through, you do not have to go through it by yourself. You've got people around you who care about you. You've got people around you who will help hold you up. And I know some people are much more private than some of us oversharers, uh, right? Uh, 
And, and maybe it's harder for you to say, hey, pray for me. I'm going through a tough time. And maybe you're not like some of the other folks that were, hey, everybody, I need some help. But, but, but there's somebody that cares about what you're going through. Really? So you don't have to go through it alone. Teenager, young person, adult, wherever they are, older, whoever you are, you do not have to go through it alone. There's a great example in Exodus chapter 17. I love this. God had given Moses a vision. Amalek was a country that was coming and fighting against the children of Israel. But God did this amazing thing with Moses in Exodus. Would I say Exodus 17? Uh, God did this amazing thing with Moses in Exodus 17 to where as long as Moses' hands were up, the Israelites were winning the battle. He was, inter he was interceding. It, it's really a picture of Jesus Christ interceding on our behalf. But, but, but he was interceding. But Moses was an older fella, and as he stood up there, his arms would start getting tired. And so he'd be like, whew, boy, got to rest those suckers. But when he would, then all of a sudden, the, Am the, the Malachites would start prevailing in the war. So Ben and Hur came up. I believe it was Ben and Hur. Was it Hur and Aaron? Whoever it was. But these two guys came up and said, here, Ben Hur. I know it's an old movie, right? Shut up. I'm telling you, one of them people are there. Aaron and Hur. Uh, <laughs> Aaron, look, Aaron's boys called him Ben. That's just how it was, okay? Um, Aaron and her, y'all are the worst. Uh, Aaron and her helped him sit down. And, and they, then, they, not only, so they, they got him and they set him on a stone, and then they came down and they held his hands up. They came and his, they held his hands up. And you know what? I am thankful. I can tell you for myself, the thrill of the vision. I truly am thrilled about the vision for this church. Amen. What God has done, oh my goodness. It's amazing what God has done already. Amen. It really is. But I'm telling you, it's just scratching the surface still. God is just getting started with what He's going to do. I am thrilled. But I mentioned it to you. I think I mentioned it to you last week, uh, Wednesday when I was preaching, how that the way this thing goes is literally, it, it's, it's amazing. I've almost got to where I'll look for it. I, I don't let it rob me of my joy, but there's times that I'll be up here. I'll be celebrating a victory. I'll be celebrating something, some miraculous thing that God has done in somebody's life. And I might literally be up here shouting and praising the Lord. And I will be. But I can think of a particular day, a few, you know, within the last couple of months to where I was just, son, praising God, just shouting hallelujah. I mean, up and down these aisles, all over. The, I'm just praising God. And literally by nine o'clock the next morning, I'm up here laying flat on my face, crying out to God to help because there's a trial. To help because, Lord, something really bad's going on right now and I need your help. Something fierce. Because that's just the way it goes. But you know what? I'm thankful for those of you who have helped hold up my arms. Amen? That help encourage and help pray and help lift up. And I'm telling you, it's the same with you. There's people in this church that will help hold up your arms. There's people in this church that will help you sit down. And, and that's the kind of uh, what we want to have here, the togetherness of the vision. Paul famously had those who helped him along the way. Paul's ministry was not a one-man show. Paul had people that helped him along the way. Refreshing his spirit, helping him in his, his labor. So there's the thrill of the vision. There's the trial of the vision. There's the togetherness of the vision. But I got to give you this one. There's the triumph of the vision. The triumph of the vision. First of all, the first place that we see the triumph of the vision is in God's continual presence. God's continual presence. Genesis 39, verse 2. The Bible says, And the Lord was with Joseph. Chapter 39, verse 21, the Bible says, But the Lord was with Joseph. In Acts chapter 7, verse 9, looking back to Joseph, the Bible says, But God was with him. <laughs> Boy, I tell you. It's a thrill to have a vision. It's a thrill to be able to do something for God Almighty. Oh, the trials are hard. Trials are hard, man. Frustrating. You throw up your hands. 
I mean, honestly. I remember reading about Paul in 2 Corinthians. He said he despaired of life. Paul said, basically, I've given up hope of living. I mean, there's other times that Paul said, hey, it would be far better for me to go to be with the Lord than it would to be here. Now, and, and, and that's true with all of us. But there's other times, I believe in 2 Corinthians, I don't believe that's what he's saying. I believe he's saying, man, I just soon died. Then go, this is tough. And I remember reading that and thinking, my goodness, Paul went through something. Let me tell you something, I've been there. I've been there. I've, I've walked through some dark valleys, man. I've walked through some dark places. But as I say that, there's a passage that comes to my mind. And it's Psalm 23. See, Psalm 23, it's, it's, it, that's, it's great to use at funerals and, and end of life and all that. It, it really is. But you can only use it in application to that. Because Psalm 23 is not a psalm for the dying or the dead. It's a psalm for the living. Yes. Yeah. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I walk through the valley. I'm, not, I'm in it, but I'm going through it. And I'm not going through it alone because thou art with me. Amen? Amen. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me, but you are with me, Lord. He leads us through His continual presence. He does not leave us. The Lord was with Joseph. And you may not see Him, but the Bible says that God has His way in the whirlwind. The clouds are the dust of His feet. I remember when Solomon was dedicating the temple, he prayed and said, The Lord dwells in thick darkness. Boy, I've been in some thick darkness before. And it didn't seem like God or anybody was anywhere near me. It didn't seem that way. But you want to know what the truth was? He was with me. He was right there. Standing somewhere in the shadows, you'll find Jesus. Amen. Because He has promised. He hath said... I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Hebrews 13, verse 5. I will never, he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And you know what that means? He'll never leave you. Never, no, never. He'll never leave you. Well, I don't know, preacher. I tried, I, I, I walked away from the Lord. Well, okay. Good luck with that. Because he said he wasn't leaving you. I'll never leave you. Amen? I'll never leave you. I'm there with you. Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the earth. Amen? He says. I love what Isaiah 41 verse 10 says. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. I like when the Bible talks about the right hand. The right hand is the strong hand. And when God says, I'm going to uphold you with my strong hand, the, the, the hand of my righteousness, I got you. Don't fear. Don't be dismayed. I'm with you and I've got you. I've got you. The triumph of the vision, the triumph of the burden is God's continual presence. But not only God's continual presence, but also the, the triumph of God's enduring purpose. In Genesis 41, 41, you find out that Joseph is set over all the land. He saves the world, including his brothers. And by the way, don't miss the big point of the story, especially Judah. Because in, in, in saving Judah, he's also preserving the promised seed that goes back to Genesis 3, 15, that will ultimately be the Lord Jesus Christ. But you've got a purpose. Through all what Joseph went through, being beaten, being sold, being in prison 10 years, Genesis 45, verse 7 says, here's what Joseph said, And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity in the earth. <laughs> God sent me before you. Wait, God, God, God sent... No, Joseph, God didn't send you. We beat you. Threw you in a pit. We sold you. God didn't send you nowhere. Oh, no, no, no. God sent me. God sent me. Amen? See, for we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. No, no. God sent me. 
God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout the land of Egypt. He reiterates this again in Genesis 50 verse 20. But as for you, ye thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Oh, preacher, the devil's really after me. Oh, man, that's, I'm sorry to hear that. If he's after you, he means evil. I'm just telling you right now, he means evil. He's up to no good. Preacher's starting to get in my life. I mean, things, things aren't going so good. I'm sorry to hear that. But understand something. Satan it might be meaning something for evil, but God's like, you, you just wait and see what I do with this. You just hold on. Because I'm with you. I'm going to bring you through this. Wait and see what I do. Wait and see what I do. That's what God says. Uh, you, you meant it for evil. The world means it for evil. Somebody means it for evil. But God means it for good. I think, I think about my whole life. I think about, you know... Some of the, the, listen, the, the way I was raised, things that happened to me in my youth, decisions I made in my youth, and even as an adult, all those things, listen, there's, none of those were God's will. Right? I mean, it wasn't God's will, but here's the thing about it. God can have His will in the things that happen. God can use the things that happen in my life that wasn't what God wanted to happen in my life. I mean, listen, God doesn't want some kid to get abused. That's never the will of God. Never. Never. But you know what God can do? He can have His way in it. And He can make me better for it. And He can make me somebody that can now identify with the, with the kid that's been abused. Right? I mean, uh, you, you, or whatever the case is. He, 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 can, he, can, uh, he, he can help me identify with what it is Maybe to have a family that, that, that's wrecked by drugs and alcohol. He can help me to identify with someone who, like myself, who turned to those drugs and, the, 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 and, 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 and so forth. I, I can identify with that now. It wasn't God's will for me to get involved in that stuff. But you want to know what? Satan meant it for evil. Don't you just, don't, can't you just imagine me as a teenager getting a hold of any last thing I could to get high? I mean, huffing anything with fumes. I mean, just popping any pill that said alcohol may intensify this effect. Popping it and drinking. Just, I mean, don't you just know Satan's looking at me and just saying, Oh man, I'm, gonna, I'm wrecking this kid. I'm going to wreck this kid. But God says, hold on a second. No, you're not. Because I'm going to intervene. And, and, and what you meant for evil, I'm going to turn around for good now. I don't care what it is. I think about many of the things I've gone through in the ministry. Hey, somebody might have meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. So two things about the triumph of the vision is God's continual presence, God's enduring purpose. Philippians 1.6 says, being confident of this very thing. I said being confident of this very thing, that he that hath begun, which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Man, I'm telling you, there's times I start wondering if I'm going to make it or not. I'm just being honest with you. Sometimes I can get in the midst of a trial to where I'm just like, Lord, I don't know if I can handle it. I don't know if I'm going to come through this. And, and, and it feels like the devil's whispering in my ear saying, you're not going to make it. You're, you're not up for this. You're way out of your depth. You're finished. You're through. And if I'm not careful, I'll start believing that sucker. But then I start thinking back, and I'm like, well, wait a second here. That's what you told me last time. <laughs> That's what you told me last time. And I start thinking that through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. I'm just preaching a minute, okay? Uh, it is grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace hath great grace will bring me home. Abraham's dream finally came through. And there was no doubt in the end that it was God. Jesus triumphed over the grave. Amen? Amen? And for the joy that was set before Him, He endured the pain. Paul finished his course with joy. And can't you just imagine, I won't spend much time on this, but Satan's like, i got to get that dude off the street, man. This is awful. i got to get that guy locked up. Whew. Got him locked up. Great. All righty then. 
Hey, Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, Timothy. And we're reading that. We're getting preached to by Paul still today. See, Satan meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Amen. It's just awesome. Uh, so I, I think about this, and, and, I'm, and I'm trying to bring this down to a close. When through the deep waters I call thee to go, the rivers of sh sorrow shall not overflow. For I will be with thee thy troubles to bless and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. Now like this. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell, should endeavor to shake, I will never, no, never, no, never forsake. Folks, I'm telling you, He will not leave you. He will be with you. And this all depends on something I'm trying to give you tonight, and I'm closing with this. The triumph of intentional perspective. The triumph of His enduring presence, His continual promises and purpose, and the, the, the triumph of intentional perspective. Hebrews 12, verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. That means looking to Jesus and looking away from everything else. 2 Corinthians 4.16 For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us. Worketh for us. Oh, these things are working against me. Hold on a second. You got their own perspective. These things are working for you. These things are working for you. The, 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 our affliction, which worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And here it is. How do you get to where you can say something like that? While we look. I'm talking about an intentional perspective. What are you looking at tonight? While we look, not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So, a vision. What a thrill. What a thrill. What a trial. Man, but what a triumph. Amen? What a blessing. Because I'm telling you, no matter what you do in this life, life's going to be tough. And a pianist could come and we'll just play out here in a moment. But... It can be tough in this life, but I'd rather it be tough in this life with me living for Jesus. The way of the transgressor is hard. Ultimately, we can have peace in whatever that we go through. And so as we all stand tonight and prepare to dismiss, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank You so much for the wonderful privilege. I'm glad that You'll be with us, God. I thank You for a vision. But Lord, there sure is a trial associated with that vision. There's a thrill, but there's a trial there's togetherness and there is a triumph, Lord. And that's where we stand tonight. Lord, you know I've got brothers and sisters that they're in the midst of that trial part. They're in the midst of that darkness. They're in the midst of that pit. God, they're in a place where they don't, they don't see no way out. But God, I pray that you'll help them to look to you. Help them to look to the eternal tonight. Lord, and we'll thank you for that, dear Lord. We love you. Thank you for your victory. Thank you for your vision. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.